It's Biology with Mr. B. Biology with Mr. B. That's me! Right, hello everyone. Right, I'll get, get straight to this. Right, so in the last webinar, I briefly introduced you to the structural idea of haemoglobin. And it's the idea that it trans helps how it sort of transports oxygen. This YouTube lesson, quite a quick one, small one for me, is to introduce the science and actually how this happens. How does oxygen actually bind to those heme groups? And why might it unbind? Why, what situations would it unbind from those heme groups as well? So get straight to it. Just want to remind you. We're going to be using the term oxyhemoglobin a lot because when oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, that's what we call it, oxyhemoglobin. Remember what hemoglobin was. A globular protein, four separate units, four tertiary proteins joined together to make a quaternary protein. But it's also a conjugated protein because in the center, it's got a non-protein element with an atom of iron, Fe2 plus in the middle. Now this heme group is in, has an exceptionally high affinity, high attraction to oxygen. And it's a heme group to which oxygen binds. Because we've got four tertiary proteins, each with its own heme group, four heme groups means four molecules of oxygen combined per haemoglobin. So the task I set, which hopefully you've had a crack at, it's not the end of the world if, if you haven't or had a chance to, because the whole point of this YouTube video is to help you do the red bit now, the extension part. So doing them together sounds a good, it is a quite a good idea as well. So my extension is the idea of actually trying to understand, again, how this hemoglobin is working and how it's working as a structural molecule. Now, I've actually had a few of you already had a go at this and you've all, and, and a few of, I'm sure there's far more have had a go at this and done this, but I've had a few sent my way as well via email and I've, I've really enjoyed actually looking at sort of the different ways people have attacked it. Um, so we have, we have the classic sort of unbound paper clips with a couple of pipe cleaners. We have the super organized pipe cleaners with a key of like the different chains and different things going on. And we even have the wibbly, I don't know, I think this student would probably actually, I hope they haven't just took wire out of like, like the walls or something. Um, but we've got, again, lots of little wire, the classic little polystyrene balls that have been colored in to represent heme groups, sticky patches. Yeah, there's some really cool creative stuff. And I, I really, this is such a, if you are one of those people who is a hands-on learner, well, get hands-on, all right? Don't just watch me videos. Don't just write things down, get hands-on. If you're not a hands-on learner, a well, nice possible way, how am I supposed to know if you've done a model or not? I'm not asking for you to submit it into me. So if you're not a hands-on learner and you don't think it'll benefit you, maybe just draw, draw a pretty picture to help you out or print a picture that you like from the internet. Hey, print one of these out, pretend that you made it. It's all good, still. So we have the success criteria, the blue bit was structural and the red bit is hopefully, I'm gonna be able to try and explain some with somewhat ease, maybe. Uh, right now, so here goes. Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin doesn't just need to be able to bind to oxygen, which obviously it will do in in places such as the lungs, when there's so much oxygen outside it. There'll be such a diffusion gradient, oxygen will automatically move in to that hemoglobin into the centre where those heme groups are found. That's association. It also needs to be able to release the oxygen in cells that are aspiring and need it. So think, if you're a aspiring cell, chances are that you won't have a lot of oxygen nearby because you're using it constantly, which means you've probably got a decent concentration gradient between you and the hemoglobin inside the erythrocytes. And if there's a steep enough concentration gradient, the oxygen will dissociate, keyword, dissociate, unbind from the haemoglobin, and it will happily diffuse into those aspiring tissues that require it. Now, we are going to be looking at graphs whereby they have tried to measure this idea of how much oxygen there is in the nearby environment of that erythrocyte. And we can measure it in a couple of different ways, but effectively they are the same thing. In pretty much all older version textbooks and websites, you will see it me oxygen measured as partial pressure, the PO2. 
In your textbook, it calls it oxygen tension measured in kilopascals. And in some environments, they combine both and they say partial pressure in kilopascals. The key thing is, if you see any of these terminologies, it doesn't matter what unit they've got, any of those terminologies, it just means how much oxygen there is. So if you've got a really high number, it's a large amount of oxygen. If it's a lower number, then there's, or there's less oxygen. So the higher one will be like a situation like a lungs, the low one would be something like respiring tissues. And there's a bit of interest. And it's only interesting because hemoglobin's weird and doesn't do it, but still. You would expect a normal liquid to take up a proportional amount of oxygen compared to the oxygen tension. Just put it this way, if you had, I'm going to try my best to write with this mouse. If you had uh, five kilopascals of oxygen tension in an environment, and you had 10 kilopascals in another environment, we would expect that a liquid to take up a proportional amount of oxygen, e.e. This one would have twice as much, supposed to be times two, twice as much compared to this one, because it's got twice as much the oxygen tension. Should be proportional. So if I gave you a graph and I asked you to predict the shape of that graph, the shape of the trend line, what would you do? I mean, this could be, you know, if you're sat there with a piece of paper in front of you, pause me, sketch it, what would you do? If I say it's proportional, you know, let's, let's put it this way. If you had, say, th say this was, because again, think of it this way. If there's not a lot of oxygen on the outside, why would there be oxygen inside the hemoglobin? It doesn't make sense. So there'd be a low, there'd be a low amount here and a high amount here. So if I said there was 10, 10% 10, um, 10 of hemoglobin was saturated with oxygen. That just means 10% of the hemoglobin has oxygen bound. That's what saturation means, how much is bound. At two, at a partial pressure of two, then at a partial pressure of four, where it would be proportional, would be twice. And where would it where would it get to? So double it again, so 40 would be here at eight, wouldn't it? And if 16 was on here, that would be at 80. Key thing is, it would be a straight line. That, yep, yeah, that's, that's a straight line. It's as straight as I'm going to get. Insert jokes there. <laughs> I'm glad Mrs. Mason didn't hear that. Oh, I should have a field day. Either way. Hemoglobin, unfortunately for you, is not straightforward. It is not a normal liquid. I don't know why I've said that. It's not a liquid, is it, really? It's a protein, quite solid. It is not a normal liquid. It doesn't take up oxygen in a way that produces that beautiful proportional relationship. It takes up in a way that produces a, this S-shaped sigmoid curve. And we call this curve, it's got a special name, the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Yep, yeah, you knew, you know you wanted to know that. Oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. So let me just talk you through. I very deliberately have written one, two, and three because you you guys have you, you're gonna have to expect it to explain this graph, not just describe it, not just say what you see, but explain why that graph is an S-shape. And think of it, if you were to describe this graph, you'd split it into three parts. A really slow increase at the stop, at the stop, at the start. A really rapid increase in the middle between two and six uh, kilopascals of, of oxygen tension. And then we will, then a, a slower increase to, you know, a levelling off idea, all the way up to this maximum partial pressure here. You describe it in three separate stages which means you need to explain those three separate stages as well. Why is it such a slow increase at the start? Why is it not the same increase as you've got here? What's preventing oxygen from binding to the haemoglobin here as we increase the kilopascals? Why is what, why isn't number two, what's, what's different here? Because we've got loads of oxygen binding and it, you know, it looks really steep increase what limitation has been removed in number two that makes binding easier? And then what limitation comes back again at number three? Is it to do with concentration gradients? Is it as simple as that? Or are there other things going on? Take a look, number one. So at number one, just let me explain what this means. If you had 
A partial pressure of one kilopascals, I promise you, that would be respiring tissue. That is a low partial pressure of oxygen. It means outside those blood cells, there's basically hardly any oxygen, if any at all, because it's constantly getting used up by the cells, by the tissues. And as you'd expect, in those situations, haemoglobin likes to dissociate the oxygen. And of course the oxygen's going to dissociate. Think of like the diffusion gradient that's going to be. If you're, if you're a red blood cell, an erythrocyte, and your haemoglobin is packed full of oxygen, imagine you just were placed in an environment where there was no oxygen, a low partial pressure of oxygen, respiring tissues. The diffusion gradient would be huge. There'd be such a pull on those oxygen molecules to move out to those aspiring tissues. Well, of course you're going to get dissociation of the oxygen. And that's exactly what's going on. To flip this another way, though, because I don't just want to talk about, like, yeah, there's loads of dissociation. I also want to try and explain why is this first bit, if I think about it from, like, an association point of view, why is, like, in terms of the increase, why is this increase really slow? Why does it take time for oxygen to bind in these situations? And here's your reason. The heme group that oxygen is attracted to, the heme group which has the affinity for the high affinity for oxygen, is in the very centre of the haemoglobin molecule. Now, you may be thinking of haemoglobin as, as a very small molecule. Of course it is, it's just a single protein, but as proteins go, it's large. And compared to a molecule of oxygen, it's enormous. It's actually quite a long way for oxygen to diffuse to, to in order to associate. And obviously the further the distance, the longer it takes. And the longer it takes, the less you can actually bind in that environment. So yeah, of, of course you're going to have this low number. Of course it's going to be a low amount, you know, concentration gradient wise. You know, there's going to be... If you're haemoglobin and you've got absolutely nothing, well, if you're in a low partial pressure of oxygen, well, the tissues have hardly anything anyway. There's not a steep concentration gradient. That's why we're really low just to begin with. But it also is a really slow increase because that heme group is in the centre and the diffusion just takes so long. We have this slow increase to begin with. So number two. Something must change. Something, that limitation of the heme being right in the centre, that must have changed in number two. Otherwise, why are we suddenly going to this really steep increase? So here's what actually happens. When the first oxygen molecule manages to bind to a heme group, it actually causes a complete shape change in the protein of the haemoglobin. We call this a conformational change. A complete shape change in that protein. And the shape change makes it better at its job. It exposes the final three heme groups to the oxygen. I'm not I'm going to rephrase that. It doesn't expose it like, oh, I'm now on the outside. Of course, it's still towards the middle, but it's just not as completely tucked and hidden away as it was to get that first oxygen in. So we've got this lovely conformational change and the shape change allows oxygens number two and three to bind quite quickly afterwards down a diffusion gradient. So we have a steep increase as oxygen molecules number two and number three start to bind. Notice how the increase starts to level off about 75%. Because it's when you have that third oxygen molecule bound, that's when things start to get more difficult again. So let's look at number three. Once the haemoglobin molecules contain three oxygens, it becomes very difficult for the fourth molecule to diffuse in and associate with the heme group. Just really think about this. Inside that haemoglobin, if it has three oxygen molecules, think about the oxygen concentration inside it. It's huge, isn't it? huge oxygen concentration inside the haemoglobin molecule and these heme groups are very close together i know they're in their separate tertiary structure to separate polypeptide chains but they're still very close together that is a significant pull and a significant attraction it makes it very difficult 
to have a decent concentration gradient of oxygen to allow further diffusion, further binding to that fourth haemoglobin. Now, of course, of course, the fourth haemoglobin can become saturated, can become bound. You just need a huge partial pressure of oxygen, the likes of which in the human body, you only really get next to the alveoli in the lungs. So the curve will always level off after 75% and it always level off closer and closer and closer it gets to 100%. 100% saturation is virtually impossible. Although the mammalian lungs do a pretty good job of getting, getting there. So a little summary from mammalian. Mammalian hemoglobin is very well adapted to transport oxygen to the tissues of the mammal. It is absolutely fantastic at taking it up. You know, if you've got a decent partial pressure of oxygen, virtually all the oxygen, the hemoglobin molecules are going to be saturated. And it only rapidly releases it when you get down to a low partial pressure of oxygen, which is great. It's only going to release the oxygen to the cells that need it most. The oxygen tension found in your lungs, which is usually about 11 kilopascals, there or thereabouts, is sufficient to produce almost 100% saturation, which again is, is fantastic bit of evolution and fantastic efficiency measure for our systems. And the oxygen tension in our aspiring body tissues is usually so low, it quite rapidly causes oxygen to dissociate readily from oxyhemoglobin to break those bonds and to follow the diffusion gradient. Okay, last bit of science from me. Fetal hemoglobin. Now, so we've got two different spellings of fetal. Do you want to be English and old school? Advio. If you want to be American, but the correct scientific nomenclature, um, at least the worldwide version, uh, you remove the O. So I'll, I'll let you choose which one you want to do there. Fetal hemoglobin has to be different. I want to try and explain why. Fetal hemoglobin and mammalian hemoglobin need to be able to exchange oxygen. So in the same place at the same time, and this is in the placenta, the mammalian hemoglobin needs to dissociate the oxygen at the same time as the fetal hemoglobin needs to take it up and associate with it. The only way this works is that fetal hemoglobin must have a higher affinity for oxygen than normal hemoglobin. And what that does, having a higher affinity, it shifts the fetal hemoglobin curve to the left. It's always to the left, has a higher affinity. So it take a kilopascal in the middle of, of six, only 70% of the maternal hemoglobin is associated. <laughs> you can hear my daughter, I'm sorry. And whereas about 87% of the fetal hemoglobin is associated, it has a higher affinity. And again, little reminder, if you're not sure what this diagram is showing you, this is the baby's blood in the umbilical cord, and it goes into capillaries here, into villi. The mum's blood comes in here, and its capillaries fill these little grooves here. So the mum's capillaries and baby's capillaries are next to each other. The blood doesn't actually mix, because think, baby's blood might be a different blood group to mum's blood, depending on the dad's genes. They can't mix. You'd get an immuno uh, attack, and uh, you you'd get rejection of different things. So they're really close together for oxygen exchange. And in this part here, we need the oxygen to dissociate from the mum's blood, from the mum's hemoglobin. And at the same time, we need it to then diffuse to the fetal hemoglobin and be taken up, even though both situations are in the same oxygen tension. So fetal hemoglobin has to have a higher affinity so even though the mum's has given it up because, oh, I've got respiring tissue, the feet is like, yeah, I'll have that, mate. I don't need to give it up. I can still take it in. Anyway, so your job, I've got no extra tasks from the booklet right now. We'll deal with that in the next webinar. Your job, please, is to go back to model making and focus on the red points to do the extension, to do the note-based task. Please send across any questions you have to do with that as you go in, and I'll see you next week in our webinar. Right. Thank you very much. Bye.